Alright guys, such a back again today. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. Welcome to Major 3, a late one over here in Europe. But wow, what a day of entertaining matches and critical matches as well for the remainder of this tournament, but also for the remainder of season in general. Plenty to dive into today. Yeah, very much enjoying your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. All that good stuff. Let's just dive straight in. Scott was enjoying the venue right here. Honestly, thoughts, just the way everything is done. There was a few production issues today, right? But in general, the way the kind of tournament is set up, I think from the fans in the venue, it's a much more positive experience than we've kind of had so far in the CDL, like there's pop-up booths, the fans have stuff to do in the venue, kind of like the CWLS gaze, they also of course bring in a trophy, which is rather cool indeed, effectively, well, crowning the kings of the event, the trophy was revealed to effectively be a crown as follows, so thought this was really cool, Toronto done a great job on this one, can't wait to see how this goes through the rest of the weekends, but of course, um, yeah, one team has got to walk away, it's kind of the kings of the north, crowning the champions of the event, and of course, some teams have taken a massive step towards that in their matches today in the winner's bracket, now Hamza says the following, I thought was quite remarkable. I'm guessing the challenger side of the event starts tomorrow, which is why um, kind of today the players were still flying out. Now, of course, usually the pros fly out on Tuesday, have kind of Wednesday to prepare and get ready to go, and then start playing on Thursday. It's like, um, you know, maybe some of the amateurs thought, okay, let's just fly out a day early just in case anything happens. Unfortunately for Hamza's team, like as he says, two of my teammates' flights have just been cancelled another day in the life. So not sure what he's going to do, whether he's going to be able to play with a substitute to really an option here. But um, yeah, definitely going to be excited to see how the challengers thing goes, starting from tomorrow, unfortunately not with his team seemingly in attendance unless they can figure something out or they manage to get out there in time. And as Clay says, got to go back on main stage, boys. It was a success. So Clay's there this weekend, of course, not competing on the professional sides, but is well former team, the subliners, maybe needed a bit of that Clay's to ice factor if they wanted to get over the line in the game five that we saw. I mean, honestly, this series, Seattle versus New York, was to me the hardest one to predict of the entire day. Did not know which way this was going to go. Had no idea really who was going to win the game five. And of course, it comes down to a game five around 11 1 versus 1. Just to summarise really how close these teams are together. This was the end of game 1 here on the Bacage. This at a time was, I mean, look at this advantage that Sublan has had. There was a big talking point really at the start of this year that like a 50 point lead on Bacage is basically a 100 point lead just because of how like quickly you can, well, basically you spawn up, you get to the hard point straight away. You should be able to contest easily. Therefore, you should be able to theoretically just contest the game down back and forth to the end of the game once you have an advantage. But lately, teams seem to kind of be getting over that really and actually bringing big swings and big comebacks in these games and it's well certainly happened more lately than I think it did at the start of the season and it goes from well 50 points down at pretty much for the Seattle surge right here map in fairness they're pretty comfortable on right if I was New York I wouldn't have been particularly keen to play them on this run because Sim and Preds generally turn up massively on this map as pretty much is what happened towards the end but Mac had a great series here as well they win the game one game two goes their way as well like honestly there were some breakdowns coming in from New York there's no doubt about it like my big suspect question mark for them here was their search and destroy I feel like this series came down to search I thought the respawns would be split and whoever was better in the surge would win the series. That's pretty much what happened here, right? In this game too, right? I mean, look, you put accuracy in this situation, he's going to clutch or he's going to take advantage of mistakes, but you can't really be gifting him this opportunity. They take too long. They probably look at the scoreboard and see how damn accuracy he's one in four, but, um, you know, it's accuracy in a one versus two. He's probably going to find a way to win it. And then they get a bit scared and we don't hop in in time. By the time they do get to the bomb side and hop on the bomb, like um, accuracy gets the kill. I mean, you know, obviously this is a very clutchable situation from accuracy's perspective, but um, yes, yeah, certainly I think Subliners could have played this one better. Uh, end up losing this map 6-2, but I think it's Pred that goes up 12-6 and six on this map. Definitely takes over in the slaying departments. But then the comeback starts to become reality. Hydra took over Game 3 control, went like 40-23 and 23 or something outrageous. Just, um, you know, it was a Game 5 Berlin control, like, or Round 5 Berlin control that Subliners won. The reverse sweep dream was potentially alive. They really didn't turn up the first couple of maps. We knew what Subliners are capable of, especially in some of these respawns. They prove it Game 3 and Game 4 when Hydra was going off like this, which pretty much is what he does here to end up winning them this Gavutu hard point taking them all the way to a game five. But, um, you know, would their fortunes turn around New York in a game five? I often feel like there's kind of a trend in Call of Duty where when a team loses a game two comfortably, in map five, it often is a very different story, actually, to what the game two was. And pretty much was the case this time around. And I thought this is an awesome graphic, actually, here from the Call of Duty League. Krimbot activated. They certainly needed him to turn up game five. He did early on, but in the crucial round 11, he got picked by Sim, and that pretty much was the end of the game. A remarkable series, a game five round 11, one versus one, just to kind of, you know, rub in the fact that 
that, you know, these two teams are incredibly closely matched. One of them, unfortunately, had to go down to losers. But both of these teams, I thought, especially with the winner of this series, is certainly a massive threat this tournament and cannot be counted out. But, um, you know, New York, again, it was a massive throw by them, to be perfectly honest. Up 5-3, you kind of felt it was going to happen. They also had a three versus two in the final round. I thought that they did a great job rotating into the B bomb sites, but then they just said, okay, if we want to give up an A plant, we're just going to give it up, which is definitely a risky thing to do, giving up any bomb site plants. I think it was an acceptable decision, but the way that, um, you know, especially the Crim 6 death right here, if he just holds on for, you know, one or two more seconds, right, and lets Kismet get in a better position, then um, they might be in a position to close out this 2v3. But losing a 2 versus 3 round 11 is not really something you can accept to happen. And, um, you know, of course, well, Sid was right, or Hydra was right there for the trade. If Crim waits at one more second and doesn't chill, they have a 2 versus 1 against Mac that they probably trade out to win the game. But game 5 round 11, 1v1, and accuracy was letting them know that 5 3 choke is certainly not ideal for them because the fact of the matter is, sub learners, if they won this, they were guaranteed top 6. That was a guaranteed 20 points. That's a big 20 points. They might still make a loser's bracket run, but it's of course going to be much more difficult now than it was through winners. Of course, in fairness, we did have Los Angeles Grillers at Major 2 make that crazy loser's bracket run all the way through to the championship victory. But, you know, will it happen again? That's going to be very difficult, and they pretty much need to not necessarily win this event, but go very deep if they want to make it to the World Championship, to be perfectly honest. And as Krim very quickly points out, heartbreaking loss to Seattle. GG's lost that one, needing that win, but we can make up for it, right? So, yeah, difficult loss for New York, certainly. Their search and destroy is where they haven't really had to prove much ice factor when they won with the Prime Classic, pretty much just winning all the respawns in that tournament. But uh, when they play a team that's actually very good at respawn, they're going to have to win some game fives. They haven't been capable of doing that so far. The ice needs to be there if this team wants to make a run because things are not going to get easier for a little bit. Now, as someone has pointed out, right, going down to losers' brackets, looking like, um, you know, arguably by far one of the better teams down there. But, um, you know, how far will they run go? Because in the second round, they might play a rather difficult competitor at that. These are the final series stats. Actually, accuracy kind of, this is a, well, an ideal series stats really from the Seattle side where you've got your pretty much young stars that are intended to drop loads of kills, loads of damage, dropping, well, 1.2s, 1.05, something in that ballpark. And then on the subliners, it's a very familiar story. Hydra with a 1.2, like, pretty much good damage, right? But at the end of the day, wasn't quite to be for subliners in terms of clutching up in those searches. And speaking of failing to clutch up, there's no better team to discuss right now than the Toronto Ultra. They play phase in this series. I thought, honestly, the intros they did were so cool here, walking them out through the crowds. Like, um, you know, one of the positive things to franchising has been, no doubt, that you do get like, cheering for teams other than Optic, right? When you do play at these home venues, Toronto, Minnesota, this type of stuff. They've done a good job on this front. I thought the way this is organized was pretty good fun as well. And of course, it started out so well for Toronto at the start of this game one because it looked like a very similar story to when Los Angeles Grillers played um, played FaZe in their final matchup. They played, of course, in the qualifier matchups last weekend, where FaZe got pretty much demolished game one on this Bacage 250 to 143 or something like that. Started off a similar way here. Abizi started out like very negative indeed. He was struggling, so was Simp. And then halfway through the game, they very much turned it on his head and, um, well, pretty much brought in a massive comeback. Right, a 50 point advantage pretty much evaporated for Ultra and they lost this game one. But they kept their composure. They bounced back in the game two. This was um, honestly a dominant game two. I feel like Ultra are really good at this map. It's really hard to beat them on it. And um, I mean, yeah, they just run through phase. There really isn't even too much to talk about here. And I thought, okay, wow, we've really got a series on our hands, especially when they then went up 2 0 in this control. Now, um, I mean, just look at this scoreboard right here on screen. This is the scoreboard after two rounds of control, Ultra up 2 to 0 in this control map. This, of course, is very reminiscent, many might, might well argue of, um, you know, what happened back in Cold War when it was the garrison control. You might remember when Clinix killed himself with the streak, the lightning strike over towards that B point. I think it was the B point that it was named over kind of by the, the green type thing over there that Sally used to like to head glitch. You guys know what I'm talking about. But again, last year there were a few moments where Toronto played phase and they can never seem to get past them. Every single good moment they had, good opportunity. Of course, the same teams this year, then the same rosters right on these teams this year that were there last year as well. And, uh, and seemingly this still exists to some degree because like surely, I mean, look at how ridiculous his scoreboard is anyway. Sympathies have combined eight kills after two rounds of control. Abizi has 20. Ultra had just won an offense at this point, and then all of a sudden, FaZe win their offense, and then the final defense was honestly like a big throw, right? Because, okay, FaZe win an offense, but like, um, you know, still, it's okay if you're Ultra up 2-0, now up 2-1, because on your offense, you can probably, you know, do something to make sure you guarantee a tick on B, for example. Like, if they'd have guaranteed a B tick, they should have been in good position to get defense round five. They don't do that, so they lose the defense round five, so from 2-0 to getting offense round five, you've kind of messed it up at that point, right? And Abizi, in fairness, after a couple of difficult maps this series, goes 43 and 26 to finish the job. Like, this was pretty mega from him. Like, he might have even done a little bit better, actually, as this, because a few seconds away here from the end of the game. But, um, you know, just goes to show that when Abizi is on form, like, this guy's absolutely out of control. And he arguably needed a map like this to get back into that kind of rhythm, get back into that form, potentially, for the rest of the tournament. That was game three, and then game four started off relatively close here on the Tuscan R point, but all of a sudden, like, FaZe was just breaking them with ease. They would just run into the 
Harpo and get all the kills and get the job done. I mean, 250 to 170 in the end, pretty comfortable for Phaeton. They hit like really good levels towards the end of the series. But it must be said against Ultra, they always seem to have kind of a better time than against some other teams. And Ultra just can't seem to get over the hump for them that still is phase right now, right? And these are the final series stats here. Insight, like he had a monster start to the series. But like, honestly, what does it take to make Selium go negative? And this guy, it's not like he's having no impact as well. He has the highest damage in the entire lobby once again. And here we go then. Final series of the day, at least the ones that I'm going to cover in this video. Optic versus Florida. Generally a team, look, we know that Florida have Optic's number quite often in these type of series. And honestly, I did wonder whether kind of coming in here for it, one Optic kind of would be a little bit more, like, you know, less susceptible, let's just say, to a team like Florida kind of, well, halting their momentum. They come out to, of course, a great reception here in Florida, as you might well expect. The series starts off, though, in what looked like an incredibly dominant fashion for Optic. They're up at this point 90 to 3. I kind of looked away from the screen for a couple of minutes, and all of a sudden, Florida were right back in the game. Like, Shotzi was having a good time talking a bit of trash right here, as you might well expect when you're up 90 to 3, game 1. If, like, hey, wow, the Optic of kind of what has been the online Optic the last few weeks or so definitely seem to, at least, come out to play at the start of this game 1. Then, though, a very different story. After the 93 advantage, like, um, yeah, things very quickly slip away, and it's actually the Mutineers that walk away with game 1. Incredible resilience from them, and it's really interesting team, this Mutineers team. Like, we know that they're kind of inconsistent, but it's like, sometimes the slaying power from Skies, for example, or Awakening, just so comes to play, it's ridiculous. Like, they have incredible gun skill on their team, but putting it together as, like, a cohesive package is so rare, but it seems to always have it against Optic, right? And they do it this game 1. Game 2 was a big bounce back, of course, that Optic most certainly needed. Scump honestly kind of put the team on his back right here when it was required. Like, um, if anything, you're looking at, well, some of these maps in this series, Scump was kind of the one doing his most for the team. Shotzi had a bit of a tough time, Prolly did as well. Of course, we'll see the stats here in a couple of seconds. But um, yeah, Scump this game 2 was honestly doing it all for Optic, keeping them alive. And this situation, honestly, was pretty ridiculous, because honestly, I thought the 5-3 comeback might well be on again. Doesn't happen, though, because I'm um, up 5-4 in this situation. Skies tries to run away, and Dave Paddy sniped his own teammate coming around this corner. I've never seen anything like this before. He takes his own teammate out. I guess, well, look, we've seen a few of them before, but like, um, I mean, just the way it happened was hilarious, and Skies' initial reaction, he was like, okay, what is this, Sunshine? Please, don't do it like this, and after this game two finish, he pretty much just stormed straight out of there. Dashi ends up clutching up. There was some talk about the fact that the crowd was trying to give stuff away in the series. Like, you know, I wish people that were kind of culpable for that type of stuff just get thrown out of the venue to set an example, but, you know, it is what it is, unfortunately, right now. Then we go into a Tuscan Control, a game mode where Optic are just so good so far this year. They lose their first defense for the first the first round they've lost in defense. It's Major 2, which is unbelievable from the Optic front. And, um, you know, but still, they lose one here in the most crucial of circumstances. Lose the map as well in favor of that. I mean, this is kind of how it goes when you lose that particular round. But, um, I mean, look at this, honestly. This spawn is just ridiculous, as Kevy Skills kind of points out. This is already, at this point, a down 2-0. Optic did end up winning this round. But, like, I'm um, just looking at how this plays out right here for Skies. Skump gets killed. He's obviously got a spawn back up. Skies is on the back tank, effectively trying to spawn trap the Optic guys, which, well, makes a fair bit of sense. And Skump spawns right on the tank in front of him. You can see him spawn up right there, literally right in front of Skies. I know there was technically something blocking it, but surely there's got to be a better spawn you can think of here, Sledgehammer, on this one. He dies immediately straight away. So that was frustrating. They do win the rounds, but, um, you know, these type of spawns, man, they seem to be costing teams more often than not. They do eventually win that map, Florida. And then it's Optic that bounce back in an unbelievable Berlin hard point. This honestly kind of set the story for what the rest of the series was potentially going to be. Somehow Optic won this. Skies went on a monster streak in the middle of the map. He dropped 40 plus in this map as well. But in the end, his glide bomb wasn't enough. Like glide bombs, well, a kind of consistent trend now, not being enough to win maps. It's Optic that take this one. But it's Mutineers in the end that win a pretty comfortable Berlin search and destroy. I felt like Optic, this should be a map where they seem pretty comfortable. They've won a lot of crucial maps on it so far this season. Doesn't happen though. Probably has a pretty tough time once again, as you know, that was kind of the big talking point coming into the event, right? Like, um, you know, look, Illy's kind of the land player. He's the main stage player. Can probably live up to those expectations. Didn't really happen this series. Karma was also talking about the 2-2 split the team was working on. Of course, Optic Search and Destroy was so valuable to them early this season. Major 1, for example. Here, they were kind of on defense. They were going 2A, 2B most rounds. And often, Florida were just effectively abused on offense. Like, they shouldn't really have allowed Florida to win as many offensive rounds as they ended up doing. So Karma definitely reckons that there were some reasons when they end up losing this series. But as it turns out, these are the final stats. Not particularly pretty. Optic go down to losers. That creates a, well, honestly, the losers bracket is already absolutely stacked. Optic are down there. New York are down there. It's going to be an unbelievable turn of events here on the Saturday, well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, beyond. But very much into your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new as always. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.